Right. So far, what we have discussed in the past, what? Is it three weeks now? Yeah, third week. What can you make out of this particular course? Maybe you've come across something at work that bothers on what we have you know, said so far. Or you've come across something in the society, like the NIA kind of you know, story, that you think we can discuss it in the contest. Can we say something? something that you want us to discuss. What is your thinking about, yeah? Let's What are we doing? We're supposed to play and then start a team station. Yeah. Backside, right? Yeah. Let everybody know your team is okay. It's part of marketing. <laughs> well, we have this uh, self-line that we play. There's four segments of the news. Yeah. So what happened is they came into us to play street right from our end. At first it was being done at the other end. And then, when you say other end? Yeah, yeah, it's from the MCR. Where, where what what is the MCR? MCR? That's the master control room. Yeah. But then at my place, the news is actually happening at a different place. Yeah. That's not being in control of everything. Yeah. So what happened was we were playing the adverts for self line. And then my boss had a call from the Marketing manager for self line line. The, the look of the advert is not right. Mm. So it became an argument between us and them. We were telling them that, hello, I think it's the TV that you guys are using, that's why it's not. Yeah. That's why you, you don't have the right yeah. picture, cards, and stuff. They were also saying that, no, they don't think so. But the original CD that they gave us of the advert was perfect. So they don't understand why it be. It shouldn't look good when, 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 when it comes to That means they did the production somewhere. Yes, exactly. And they gave you a seat. They gave you a seat. So it became an issue. And they said that they were going to be drawn, but they did not serve them well. But what, what actually happened was that it was actually at our end that the problem was. And then my boss wrote me a nice letter saying that, oh, no, I think it's your problem. It's not a problem and everything. The later I got to realize that it's actually from my end. When we ripping the CD, we actually didn't use the rest of the team. We became a problem. But then they were like, they are going to terminate the whole business. And I had to come here and tell them that I think it's our fault. We are willing to accept something. Who mind if you have to even sign new contract, you can go on. Then they actually accepted it. They, they were fine with it because they thought that if it's your fault, they must admit first, the first thing that is your fault. Excellent case of service recovery, yeah? Let's discuss the remarketing contest. Well, well, in the first place, what comes to mind? What comes to mind? In marketing, general marketing content, before you position it in relationship, what comes to mind? Customer satisfaction. Customer centric. Now, the base principle, which is basic for marketing, is the need of the customer. That's the base. Customer satisfaction. Now, if the customer is not satisfied, you don't go ahead to do what? To ascribe blames or to actually say that, oh, it's not me, it's you. That is never done in marketing. That is never done. You don't preempt who is at fault. You do what? We research. So the fundamental rule in marketing is that customer satisfaction. And any organization that is customer central does what? First of all, accept, apologize, and then say that you are going to get back to the, back to you with the word, with some findings. If 
for example, the boss had actually done that, man, those staff won't be there. Now, what is happening is that you kind of uh, instigated future events, all right? You set some kind of precedent. Next time, they're going to say that it's you again because you haven't actually, you know, claimed it, but it could be their fault. But once you set that precedent, then, then of course you have to guard against future occurrences because then whenever that thing happens or something happens, blame game, you know. So in the spirit of customer centricism or marketing principles, you always want to acknowledge that there's a problem. You always want to be apologetic, so to speak, or you're always wanting to express concern and say that we're sorry that you don't find this satisfactory. We're going to investigate and come back to you. Don't be in a hurry to say that it's not our fault. It is never marketing. It has never been marketing. That is pure product-oriented kind of approach. Because you believe that your product is a problem. It shouldn't be like this. That's a pure case. Now, let's look at it from a relationship perspective. Relationship is supposed to be win-win. Now, I like the way that you said, even if we have to you know, underwrite the custom, we're supposed to do that. It's about retention. You can say that, yes, you can go with your business. Can I that? But if the person leaves, there's a ripple effect. Most chances are that this executive is going to have a word with other colleagues and say, oh, these people don't mind them. You know? So on a relationship perspective, you want to look at how do you retain the customer. All right? And sometimes retention actually comes with some cost. You know, well, not sometimes, in most cases. You've got to spend money. In the first place, you've actually made him hungry. You know? So how do you recover? A recovery has to go with certain kind of words and certain kind of actions. And then you make sure that it doesn't happen again. That's a right, you know, a very good example. What else? Okay. Yeah. I think one of the reasons why I hope we do such a thing is because nowadays the customers they are they, they do not forgive easily. Because the, the competition is so high, there are so many alternatives. So they are very easy to switch. Yeah. So the company which you might want to preserve its own image or protect itself. Mm. Because when you tell the customer, oh, sorry, it's our fault, then they say, okay, maybe you are low quality. No, it's not admission of guilt, you know? But I agree with you perfectly on the fact that customers or consumers are now savvy. Availability of choice, proliferation of services, alternatives, you know, and a new entrance, you know? Because of that, it's making the industry or it's making the, 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 the market very competitive and people are able to immediately pull the plug and say that I can send my business elsewhere. Because truly too, there are a lot of you know outlets over there. All right. Unlike those days where if you said I will pull the plug, where are you going? So you've got to entertain the nonsense. But these days, like you said, consumers are very savvy. They know where the quality is coming from, or they know what is of quality anyway. And they can actually take their business elsewhere, you know. But when you say that you are sorry, it's not admission of guilt. Definitely as an institution, things can go wrong. But you see, the hardest part of everything is about what? The recovery bit. Are you able to have that humility to say that yes, we're sorry, but then, you know, we will actually make sure that it doesn't happen again. All right. You can you can offer service quality, I mean, from the word go, but how do you turn around when things go wrong? That's what actually sells businesses. All right. As soon as something goes wrong and you're able to rectify it, be very responsive, rectify it, and then promise that it's not going to happen again. That's where loyalty you know, ties in. Not the act of doing it. The act of doing it, yes, everybody can start and do it. But how are you able to recover? when the service goes wrong. Are you with me? So yes, don't feel that by saying, oh, we're sorry, it means admission of guilt, and the customer say, I'll pull up. Then it wouldn't even be a relationship-oriented customer. Any relationship-oriented customer will give you the opportunity once you admit, 
and then give that reassurance that you can actually rectify the situation. My problem is that it doesn't mean we should put a limitation on you as a business. It shouldn't. Relationship shouldn't cost heaven and net. Yes, that's the point. So at what point do you realize, okay, as a business, you should be fed up? When, for example, clearly the client or customer has not defined the terms and conditions of service. That's correct. I mean, you set benchmarks, don't you? And that's why you can't operate relationship marketing in a vacuum to say that, oh, yeah, we're doing relationship marketing. You don't have rules and guidelines governing you know, the entire process. Organizations work with systems and work with certain benchmarks. And by the time you start, you have a team that have sat down, evaluated you know, your parameters and say, at this point in time, when it gets to this, that's the bottom line. And even then, some businesses will still try to push the, the boundaries further. It's like managing a, 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 a key client, all right? At what point do you consider the person a key client? Maybe at a particular range of commitment, in terms of spend, in terms of value, in terms of you know, the longevity of the relationship. At what point would you consider it as a no-no? That is when maybe the person is making frivolous demands, you know, that it goes beyond the budget that you set. Obviously, you can't run a business like that because then it means that the sustainability of the business itself is not guaranteed. I mean, if the sustainability is not guaranteed, how could you then maintain the relationship? So, relationships shouldn't cost arm and a leg. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't cost the other leg and then say, that, oh yeah, we're in relationships, so hooray, oh, I need biscuit, oh yeah, pass it. <laughs> I need toffee, oh yeah, hooray. You can't do that, you know. So yeah, we should understand that there are contexts, you know, and there are rules and regulations regarding the relationship. In any relationship that is not where we remember, is driven based on cooperation, based on win-win. There's no win-lose approach. So if this company is going to cost you the entire budget, why do you want to proceed? Or why do you want to keep maintaining? You know. So I'm sure that the systems, I mean the organization might have actually come out with rules and regulations to say that at this point is a no. And it has to be empirically based. It shouldn't be just a, a subjective, you know, kind of it has to be well discussed within the structure. And then even within the industry a certain limit and then maybe a little bit beyond it. So that you know that you're not just going to make arbitrary pronouncement and say, as soon as somebody shouts, let's say that we can't go Are you with me? Okay. Now, today we're going to look at, and we're on chapter three, we're going to look at relationship economics. And just like we're saying, you know, the economic effect of establishing relationship, you know, it is not a fairy tale that you're in a relationship. Because companies are actually in business. And fundamental to marketing or to business is profitability. You can argue about CSI and things like that. They're all profit work, kind of uh, geared. Because at the end of the day, your CSI program even is supposed to give you some level of recognition. So that society would know that you're doing your part to sustain it. And as a result, what? Give you the customer. All right? So in business, whatever strategy you put across, it is not a fairy tale. It is not just for its sake. It is as a result of you making sure that you can sustain the model. You can sustain the approach. You can sustain the business. You can sustain the relationship. All right? If you can't do that, then of course that strategy is no strategy. You know. So, we're going to look at what does it cost to maintain a relationship and what are the activities that actually goes into relationship you know, uh, uh, build. So, can, we tell, can, you, can anyone tell us the central focus of relationship marketing and the economic argument of What is the central focus of relationship that like we've been talking about? Yeah. We just talked about some of them. Yeah. Thinking is it is for the firms to be 
be able to maintain that's right their customers yeah. knowing that it will almost cost sometimes yeah to maintain the customer yeah than to try to acquire anyone. That's right. Yeah. So we are saying that the traditional market was only about what? Attracting or you know gaining customers. But then relationship marketing say retain, you know. So the focus is about what? A defensive approach where you make sure that you know you're protecting your territory from invasion. You know, you're protecting your territory, making sure that competitors wouldn't have any reason or there wouldn't be any reason for your customers to leave. So the central approach or the central focus is how do you retain the customer that you have acquired, that you have spent so much to acquire. Because the understanding is it costs a lot more, twice, three times to what? To, to get a customer than to retain them. And that's a cliche. Right? It's a cliche in marketing that it costs a lot more to attract or to gain a customer than to retain them. Why do you think that logic holds? Because you have to sell your idea to a new customer. Mm -hmm. But for the good customer who knows much about your company, it's quite easy to sell a new product. That's right. Alright. I mean, yeah. I mean, selling your new idea, it happens that you have to put in a lot of logistics. Yeah. Yes, to win one customer. That's right. against the one that you already have. Yeah. So. Let's give a scenario of where you want to set up. Alright, a scenario of where you want to set up. You, 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 you've gotten some ideas that you, you can be in business. And say, like, what are some of the activities that you take to, to start something? What are some of the activities? Yes. Infrastructure. Infrastructure. It costs you a lot more to put the systems in place, alright? Maybe you want to sell ice cream. You want to get a table, get a fridge, get the electricity. You understand? You get all these things set up, and then the cost of operating itself come in. You've got to go to a uh, buy set, for example, to make some noise, you know. And it, it costs a lot more money. Apart from going to buy set, you've got to do personal contact, maybe some mail shots. You can imagine the stress, the time, you know, and even the psychological aspect of it. What is the psychological aspect, the emotional aspect? What is it? The expectation whether people walk into the shop or will not. You understand? The pressures on your home, like resources, your domestic resources. Sometimes you've got to even use your own money dedicated for the family. All right, into the business. There's so much that comes to what? Getting someone. Or getting somebody walk into the shop. All right. Now, once the business gets going and people start, you know, patronizing, the assumption is that it's not gonna cost you vaccine maybe three times, all right? You might have gained some stability that it would maybe cost you, let's say, half of that airtime, maybe to pass on some announcement on things. And majority of the relationship now is focused on what? Your internal, or your one-to-one, you know, person-to-person -person discussion when the person comes in. How good are you able to what, receive this person, convince them that, oh, is the product still working for you? How best can I, you understand? And key is that by that time, you might have actually got access to the customer telephone number, access to their email, access to their home address, access to any other foreseeable or any other possible contact that you would have or you would need to maintain that relationship. Now, back then when you established, you don't have any contact number, you don't have any of these things. What happens? It costs you so much. And to gain these things onto the system, not to forget the people who are even to man or to sit and type in the telephone number. It's going to take them hours or even days or whatever it takes for them to input those data. So you can imagine the kind of cost upfront. You know that goes into what gaining a customer way, way, way supersedes that of what retaining them. But is that always true? Is that always true? And if not, what are some of the things that may not necessarily be true about this?
those two are gone, and you still care about the yes. CSR stuff, then all those things have to come in place, which are also expensive yes. when it comes to maintaining customers. That's right, yeah. And moreover, to sometimes the few customers that you've got, if you are able to sell them well, they will also bring additional customers which will not cost much to the company. So normally it is not always the case that when my wife is prospecting for new customers, cost to be against cost. Excellent. Well contested. The cost of feeding the customers is yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Realize that it comes too high yeah. and it's not profitable. Yeah. And there's no need to cost them. That's right. Yeah. So, like you said, there are instances that the maintenance alone is even costing a lot more money. All right. And then there are industry specific issues. Sometimes some industries don't lend themselves to you know, uh, retention being, being uh, uh, less costly. You know. Some industries, the acquisition, customer acquisition is far too cheap than retaining. All right. So sometimes industry specifics, you know, can actually, you know, kind of break that particular rule or can define that particular principle that uh, what do you call it? retention is far cheaper than acquisition. But it is general thinking that <coughs> again, one can argue it depends on how you want to do the retention. How do you program the loyalty schemes so much that it doesn't actually become a monster or an albatross? You don't go about promising him and say that, oh, hurry, for us, there, Charlie, we'll give you 10 gigs. Thank you for two seats. <laughs> if you tell our customer that, yeah. No, you've got to be realistic, making sure that you can work, maintain those relationships. And like a funny thing, they said that when people start working, they will be opening the doors and things like that, the car doors, you know. Oh, no, let me open it. <laughs> and they go to the car, they say, oh, please, find the, find the car. You know, once the relationship starts getting, they realize that you You always have to be on the lookout. And if you're not on the lookout and the lady ends up with the car, they say, ah, why don't you say that? <laughs> You understand? So you have to make sure that from the beginning you set the benchmarks. To what extent can you actually maintain you know, the relationship? So be very, very practical, realistic about the market. What is or uh, what can be acceptable in order to maintain a sustainable